afternoon, everybody. For those of you that were just over watching uh, Foul Territory with Scott B and the boys, thank you for watching Dodgers Territory now. We are your hosts. I am Alana Rizzo. That is my pal, Clint Pasias. And Clint, we are on the air as the solar eclipse is going over, supposed to be going over uh, Boston right now or Massachusetts right now. So I'm not going to be able to see it. But I was with the team back in, you know, seven years ago or whatever, when we were in Pittsburgh and we all had our glasses. It was pretty sweet. I'm sorry that you're going to miss it. I'm going to try to catch some of it. If not, I'll just reenact it with like a fire and a tortilla. I've already seen the memes on there. So. <laughs> Anyways, there we are. I, was, I wasn't uh, in this photo. Thanks a lot, Dave Vesse, for making sure that he didn't capture me in this. But the real DV, David Vesse, who does such a tremendous job covering the Dodgers. <laughs> I have a funny story about Justin Turner and Yasiel Puig during the last eclipse. I don't think I can t say it on the air, but um, that'll be for a different time. Maybe when we've had some uh, some beverages to discuss that. But that was a fun time. And there's another one right now, and you're not going to see it again until like, what, 24, 44 or something in the state of Ohio. So uh, big things happening celestially. But speaking of big things, how about time for the big ticket? All right, so what is your thought about this? I know you watched every single game. Miguel Rojas was not pleased about the length of the rain delay, Clint, over the course of the series in Chicago. Not only was he not pleased with the length of the rain delay, they certainly were not pleased with the field conditions and was very concerned about the health and safety of the players after that long delay. Sloppy game, sloppy field conditions, sloppy game for the Dodgers kind of overall. I like seeing this out of Miggy Rowe. You want to see, that's why you bring in a veteran like this, to to complain, to, to care about his his team, his pitchers, uh, the guys around him. Uh, you, know, you don't like to see it. You, we were talking before the show. Um, you can't really get a dome on Wrigley Field at this uh, at this point, and it's a very, very long life. But um I, I I have to agree with Miguel Rojas in this situation. It's a dangerous situation. It's a dangerous uh, field, you know, playing conditions. You can get people slipping, hurting themselves, pulling something. And they're not worried about this one game. They're worried about the entirety of the season. They're trying to play 162 games plus playoffs, already coming off of, uh, you know, a spring training. There's a lot of baseball to be played. And we're talking about one game on a Sunday in Chicago. Just maybe at some point cut your losses. I can understand not wanting to have to go back there and, and may have a makeup game, but obviously the health and safety of both teams, not just the Dodgers, of course, but the Chicago Cubs as well, but not taking any excuses. They had three errors in the game. They lost the game, the first uh, series that they've lost so far in this young 2024. But a good thing that happened over the course of time with Chicago Cubs is the way that Yamamoto pitched. This is the guy, Clint, that the Dodgers hoped that they were getting. Yeah, this is the guy that every bit uh, Yamamoto as advertised. This is the guy you go and spend uh, ultimately with posting fees, $375 million or whatever it is over the next decade plus looking nasty. The curveball has been an absolute weapon for this dude of late over his last two starts where he has, he's racked up 13 strikeouts over uh, 10 innings, put that South Korea start in the trash there was a lot of problems there they were trying to work through a different setup a different delivery to try to mitigate the the pitch tipping went back to something more comfortable for him and it's looking like it was the right move and um three starts in we're getting uh, the maybe the best version of yamamoto that we could hope to expect for the entirety of the season Austin Barnes said that when he gets his feet under him, he's going to be one of the great pitchers in the game. Dave Roberts called him an artist, and he certainly kind of painted that masterpiece or pitched to a masterpiece. How about that? Dot in the corners, but eight Ks, but he's punched out 13, Clint, and has not given up a run in his last 10 innings. That's impressive stuff. I agree with you. Throw that outing in Korea out, but this is much better in terms of the way that he's headed. Yeah, we know the splitter is a weapon for him. I love what Dave Roberts said about the curveball. As good as any right-handed curveball in the game right now, of course, the best curveball in the game will always be Clayton Kershaw Clayton to Kershaw. Dave Roberts, and, <laughs> and rightfully so. But the curveball, like I said, has been a, a real weapon for him. He throws it a little bit different than your traditional curveball, they say. I don't know. I haven't seen him up close, but he's got that thumb on it and kind of spins it like a yo-yo. Uh, and it's it 
it saved him. It bailed him out in that first inning where he loaded the bases, nobody, nobody out, filled with Cubs, got out of it, escaped damage, you can let out the roar. Uh, that's the best stuff. That's a, the stuff you want to see uh, from this dude, again, who you invested so damn much money into to lead your staff after you know a, a full season of pitching struggles starting pitching struggles they had last year love to see yamamoto i see richard flores here getting back for a second we got a dollar 99 super chat thank you richard um asking about the the sloppy field condition alana does dave roberts have the right to pull players off the field as i sorry i switched gears i know we're talking yamamoto but i got excited i saw a super chat no i'm I'm all, all about the super chats and thank you richard for that no i think so i mean you have to as a manager you're, you're first and foremost the safety and security of your players is the of the utmost importance so if dave really felt that the playing surface was not safe for his players he absolutely has a right to pull his players off of the team off of the field rather same situation if it was a security risk if there's people throwing stuff at the players or there's some sort of security risk they have a right as a manager to take their team off the field i mean dave is a very um fair guy right he's a very fair person and understands that this is a business also and also they don't want to have to travel back to the north side to have a makeup game but yeah safety and security absolutely comes first i want to get back to yamamoto here for just a second more than the fans clint i think the teammates his teammates were cheering for him to have the types of outings that he's had his last two times out because they want him to be successful and they know how hard it is to play this game, let alone when you're coming from another country to have to have that type of success on the biggest stage. And Mookie Betts was calling for a beer shower for his boy. I love that. Not It's not even sake. It's beer. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, earns a first career win as a Major League Baseball player, pulled out from his postgame scrum to go celebrate. You know, they, you know how it goes. They shower you with beer, whatever else they could find there. I don't know how much stuff is available there uh, in the visitor's dugout or visitor's clubhouse. Listen, at- it's the Midwest. It's Chicago. There's plenty of beer there. Those people know how to do it right. Plenty so little, of beer. A little bit of deep dish on them. <laughs> Little Chicago dog, it's all sticky. It's fine, but that's uh, awesome. You want to see your your team that you love. That there's chemistry. These guys love each other. They want each other to have success. That was a, that was a cool move by Mookie. Got a, another another veteran for this team, uh, making sure he's taking care of his boys. I love it. I love it. All right. Uh, another thing that came out of the weekend wasn't at the big league level, but it's a guy trying to get back up there, Clint, and that is Walker Buehler looking good again in a rehab start. He's so much closer to coming back. Dave Roberts, when I had him on high heat the other day on MLB Network, said it's probably going to be you know early May, hopefully, what we're talking about as far as Walker Buehler is concerned. So that is great. That's great news. Um, the one thing you want to do is come out of those rehab starts healthy. He probably has two more to go. Yeah, two, maybe three. Uh, the whole point or a part of the point of them pushing him back this, uh, you know, at least a month into the season was he hasn't pitched for the better part of two years. Let him get back and stay pitching through the season into the postseason. You got that innings limit to worry about. It's probably going to be, I don't know, 140, 150 innings at, at absolute most this year. But looking good, looking nasty. What did he pick up? Uh, he, struck, he retired 14 of 16 batters in his second rehab appearance there with Oklahoma City. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I think the, the calendar's kind of working against him, maybe coming back sooner. I think he could be back sooner in an emergency situation. You get a starter back. But what do you think? Are you are you feeling like maybe the Dodgers welcome the Braves to Dodger Stadium on, I think it's May 3rd. Do you think that that could be the day we see Walker Bueller back on the bump? I mean, that's great. I, there's not a situation that I wouldn't put Walker in, but I think the team would like him to start at home, obviously. Uh, that would probably be better. I don't think he cares. He'll start on the moon if he has to. I know he's chomping on the, you know, chomping at the bit to get back. Um, on on that bump but yeah I, there's no doubt that teams certainly kind of schedule their starters uh, for certain situations whatever's going to make the most sense and put them up for the you know the biggest part of success to have them to set them up for success rather so that would be great you know and it stinks too i know that we're talking dodgers territory but uh thoughts going out to spencer strider obviously of the atlanta braves that sucks when you have these pitchers uh of this quality i mean little think about this for just a hot second clayton kershaw Garrett Cole, Max Scherzer, Justin Verlander, Spencer Strider, uh, Shane Bieber, all likely, potentially, not every single one, but some, some Hall of Fame caliber pitchers, Hall of Fame caliber names on that list. 
And we can go on and on and have a whole conversation. We're not going to do it on this Dodgers territory, but a whole type of conversation about what is causing these injuries to these marquee big ticket starting pitchers. So hopefully Spencer Strider um, doesn't have to have surgery, but it's it's looking that way. But yes, to your point, Clint, uh, it would be great to have Bueller on the bump on May 3rd. Yeah, just I, I have no problem with him taking his time. We know uh, he I don't think he's even pitched in the pitch clock era officially yet. So that's a whole <laughs> thing. I know we're getting into the pitch clock on this show and all the injuries. But yeah, the the, the rash of injuries, is it's really uh, it's depressing for a baseball fan. Oh, it's awful. All right. We have a, a guest on our program today. We're always excited when we have guests, guests on. And it's Jeff Ponce with Baseball America. Awesome to have him on the program, too. And we're, you know, we're connected with Baseball America this year on, on Dodger territory and on foul territory. And uh, Jeff, it's great to be with you. Thanks for uh, taking the time uh, to be with us. So let's talk a little bit about some of these up and comers as far as the prospects are concerned in a, uh, a, a deep farm system for L.A. Yeah, absolutely. It's a uh, it's a loaded system as always, and I think you know the thing about the Dodgers is they do as good of a job in terms of uh, acquiring talent, whether that's through the draft, whether that's through trades, um, whether that's through the international market over you know the course of several years. And the practices are good just in terms of how they spend their money, and they seem to identify just great talent overall. Uh, their player development staff, you know, has the ability to sort of get the most out of. And I mean, I think we see that with uh, the amount of players that they've produced that are not only on their opening day rosters, but everybody's opening day <laughs> rosters. Um, and then, you know, in addition to that, of course, you know, have uh, a handful of top 100 prospects as well. And one host way to Paula, who seems to be one of the biggest movers right now in all of baseball and the minor leagues. Yeah, you got. Uh, I think we have five Dodgers in your top 100 right now. We know there's going to be more by the time the the next uh, update comes out because this team just keeps finding uh, different talent. They keep printing pitching prospect talent. We know that traded away a couple of guys. We saw uh, Ryan Pepio have a hell of a game uh, the other day. Let's talk for a second there. You mentioned uh, DePaula. What can we expect out of this dude? He's 18. He's already making moves. You've, you've seen the power he showed out in the uh, the prospect breakout game. Tell us a little bit about DePaula, what you're uh, liking out of Josue. Yeah, and this is a guy dating back to around the time they signed him um, because he was born here in America, I think was primarily raised here in America. He's actually the cousin of uh, all-time New York City basketball great Stefan Marbury. Obviously, very famous <laughs> basketball for me. Um, which is a cool, you know, sort of element, but, you know, signed out of uh, the Dominican Republic and is an outlier in terms of athletic and, and power output. It was something that when they do like force plate testing and a lot of this stuff that they're now doing behind the scenes, um, he's a guy that really stands out. The skills are there as well, right? When we look at athletes, we look at players, you know, there's that physical athleticism ability, the capacity that they have in their body, how much power they can get to that sort of thing. And then you have the actual skills, the ability to play the game, to put the bat in the ball, swing at the right pitches. DePaul has had that in spades really since he signed. Uh, we're starting to see him get to in a more natural way without having to sell out for power in game. And I just, I think this is a guy that the comp that you've sort of heard is also a player that came out of the Dodger system is Jordan Alvarez. He's called baby Jordan. I think even by some people in like the player development side of the Dodgers, but He's a really exciting prospect, and I think we're starting to see that blossom a little bit. And the feedback was really loud during the spring. We're talking with Jeff Pontes of Baseball America. Always happy to have him on the program. And Jeff, let's talk a little bit more about Dalton rushing because the Los Angeles Dodgers have just signed Will Smith to a large extension. You know, 10 years, $140 million. He's obviously not going to be behind the plate for the next decade. What more can you tell us about rushing? Yeah, rushing when he uh, was drafted and then signed out of Louisville, did not sign him in the first round technically, but was a guy that I think a lot of teams had on their board. If the numbers were right, they probably could have gone that direction. He's an elite hitting prospect when it turn comes to contact. Got He's an insane bat speed, um, just really tornado type of bat speed, how fast the bat moves through the zone. Um, there's a lot of power there. It's really just been a matter of him refining himself as a catcher, which is a big part of that position, maybe even more so than any other position in the major leagues in terms of all the things you have to know, all the things you have to understand and do really well. And then, oh, hit, by the way. Um, and I think that part of the game has been a little bit slower for him. He has made some some leaps and bounds. He's dealt with some injuries, 
But I think mm-hmm. overall, when we take a step back, we remove the injury stuff, we remove the defensive questions, just from a, a, a pure offensive standpoint, rushing's a really exciting prospect. And if that means down the road he ends up playing a few different positions or you know, see some time in a platoon share, maybe at the major league level, play some first base. He's even played some outfield over, you know, a corner outfield over time. And DHs, I think he's got sort of that contact and power ability to really get there. Uh, but it has been, I think, passed by Josue de Paula in terms of how we rank out these prospects in the top of the system. But that's to be determined, as I said, you know, 2023 was a bit of an injury plague year for him. Yeah, we know with rushing, uh, this this Dodgers team, you can never have too many catchers. Uh, we're seeing teams these days more often kind of go to a 1A, 1B rather than the backup catcher if you can save some time, uh, you know, squatting for Will Smith here and there. But I got a different name I want to bring up to you. I know he is in the top 100. Uh, this is kind of a fan favorite name right now, talking Andy Pajes, who uh, people are clamoring for this guy to be called up. Not very much time at AAA yet, just hit his first homer. Talk to us a little bit about Andy Pajes. What do you see from him? And, and drop some comps. I love the uh, I love the comp there for DePaula. Yeah, I think, you know, with Pajes, you're looking, you know, a little bit more, it's probably like an Anthony Santander sort of outcome where, He's a really good, above-average major league hitter. There's power there. There's contact. He can play a corner outfield spot, but you know, probably not going to you know be the Gold Glove in right field or left field where he plays. Um, that being said, Pajes has done a ton over the last couple of years. We did deal obviously with the big injury um, to sort of remake his body and and keep that and coming into this spring. Um, he was a bigger guy the last time that I saw him in the Arizona Fall League at the end of 21, and you know he's really sort of trimmed up and you know. I think that's allowed him to be a little bit more explosive. He's getting higher exit velocities than he's gotten at any point in his career. And he's another guy where there is just a lot of field to hit. Um, and he's a guy that hits the ball hard at good angles, meaning he's going to put the ball, he's going to hit a lot of line drives, he's going to hit a lot of homers, and doesn't necessarily have to sell out for it either. It's a high-skilled player with some power. Um, I think defensively, you know, you're, you're happy if he's an a a average or fringe average corner outfielder. Um, but he's going to make his money from hitting. So I think he's sort of one of those guys like falls into that Santander sort of comp where he's a guy that could hit anywhere from like 260 to 280 in any given season with like 25, maybe 30 home runs on the high side. Jeff, he's in the lower tier of your top 100, but he is in the top 100. And with the struggles that James Outman is having right now offensively for the Dodgers, do we see Pajes up soon? Do you think this could be something sooner rather than later? Yeah, I mean, you know, he's on the the 40 man roster. Um, so that's less of a of a hurdle in terms of getting him on to, you know, the the active roster. Probably just a matter of shuffling around. Um, there's obviously it's a deep, you know, a very, very deep major league roster, and there's a lot of moving pieces there. But I think, you know, if Outman struggles or there's another there's an injury in the outfield, he's probably uh an option. Obviously, there was a recent injury with Jason Hayward. As we see there, Luke on the screen saying one of our chats, uh, chatters here, Dodger system is the best, no argument, where they have been uh, arguably the best over the last five years, maybe 10 years. I don't know about that far, but let's look at pitching. You got to talk pitching. One guy who's in your top 100, uh, top 100 is Gavin Stone. Saw him start yesterday in Chicago. A little bit of uh, bad luck against him, thanks to the field conditions we were talking about before. But Stone is one of those guys. He's We've, we've heard a lot about the disgusting changeup. He's got fastball. He's got the, the ability to paint. He just needs to put it all together. Uh, what can we expect from Stone? in the Dodgers rotation this year. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, it's something that we sort of forget with so many pitchers when they first come up to the major leagues, there's a huge adjustment period, maybe even more so than there is for position players. Um, it's just, there's, there's so much more detail there. You know, you really can't make any mistakes if you really want to be able to execute. And even sometimes you can make a great pitch and somebody still hits it 450 feet. I mean, it's just the nature of how baseball is. And I, I think that, you know, that experience is something that Stone did experience in his initial sort of ascent of the major leagues. We had huge expectations last year, and as often happens with pitching prospects, they don't really perform the first time they're up. But he made, went down to AAA. He made some adjustments. We saw a better version of that. We then saw a better version of that in spring. And I think sort of in his first start, and as you said, dealt with some bad luck and some weather considerations. But what I'm seeing underneath the hood is 
he's really sort of changed his approach when it comes to his fastball. He's throwing a lot more sinkers now than he threw last year. Everything in his arsenal is up a few miles per hour, including the changeups and the off speeds, which I think for a pitcher like Stone, when he doesn't have incredible fastball shape, um, like someone like Emmett Sheehan or, you know, others that have been in the, the Dodgers rotation over the years. Um, he sort of needs that extra velocity and location. We've seen that. The other thing that I think is really interesting is he's sort of using this, this triangle of fastball approach where the cutter last year was a little bit more of like a hybrid breaking ball cut fastball where he's got a lot more vertical movement on it in terms of ride this year, a little bit less horizontal movement. So it's a little bit more like a cut fastball and it's up two to three miles per hour. I think it's up to like 92.5 um, from like 88, 89 last year, 90. So that's a big jump in terms of the shape. And I think that allows his change up to really play off of that fastball when you don't necessarily know how much it's going to move one way, how much it's going to ride, or, you know, if it's going to be a cutter. So it sort of gives him a different plan of attack. I think that's something I've seen with Stone that has been really encouraging and I'm sure was deliberate with this Dodgers player development and pitching staff. Jeff, we've mentioned a couple guys here, obviously, with DePaula and Rushing and uh, Gavin Stone, but is there anybody else that we should be paying attention to? Who should fans know about? Yeah, I you know I, we obviously mentioned the guys that are sort of in that top 100. Um, the other players that I think are really interesting that are just sort of on the cusp. Um, there's one shortstop, so you know, infielder in, this, in the organization by the name of Joinery Vargas. Uh, Vargas is a player that has come up you know, well into the end of last season in terms of on the cusp of the top 100, there's usually about 150 players that we turn in and sort of debate and rank out and grade and, and sort of go through our reporting, et cetera. And Vargas was a player that, you know, potentially we thought, um, you know, could jump onto the top 100 very soon. Um, I think we're going to see him really shortly in terms of where his ascent is there. There's a couple other pitching prospects as well as there always is with the Dodgers. Uh, Jackson Ferris, you know, left-hander that they got, um, you know, uh, in the Michael Bush trade. Also, Zaire Hope, <laughs> who had a massive opening weekend, had three home runs, um, two guys that they acquired. And, it, you know, I think this just goes to show, anytime the Dodgers are in contention and they're looking to trade for your prospects, beware. And I don't think the Cubs regret trading Michael Bush at this point, but I think, you know, 10, 15 years down the line, we might be talking about it a little bit differently. Of course, when you got River Ryan, you got Kyle Hurt, Peyton Martin, and uh, a guy who's off our top 30 list, but I think we'll jump on, seventh round Arda Marshall. Patrick Copen throws really, really hard. As a sweeper that I've been told has been up to 88 miles an hour, like 14 inches of horizontal break. So just more nasty stuff in the pipeline for the Dodgers. Not a shock. I'm going to need to see Ferris and Bueller on the same 25-man roster soon. As soon as possible, Absolutely. please make that happen. Clint, what do you got for him? I got one last one. Uh, one of the, the names I know folks are also very excited about, one of the pitching names, we could see him this year if things go really, really wrong, but is River Ryan. Another one of those kind of uh, Andrew Fleeceman deals uh, that <laughs> he's able to pull, I think it was from the Padres. How far away is somebody like a River Ryan and how far did he miss on uh, your top 100? Sure. He's sort of creeping out in the cusp. Um, the issue with some of these Dodgers guys in the top 100 is – the top of the system is sort of so deep and there's nobody that's like a top five to 10 prospect in the entire top 100 is there's like a bunch of guys who are kind of locked out by other players. And I think if we could shuffle and maybe reorder and certainly there's some other outlets out there that have River Ryan on the top 100, um, it's a great slider. He throws really hard. The fastball has pretty good shape, but he's going to have to locate it. Um, in terms of developing the third pitch, I think has been the, the biggest question that we've kind of bounced around with Ryan as to whether he's a top 100 prospect or not. Uh, I tend to be more on the pro Ryan side. I, I think he's a really interesting prospect when you think about what his background is, the fact that he was a two-way player at a small school mm -hmm. in Division II in college, and then really didn't pitch when he was drafted by the Padres if he only played positionally and then was acquired, of, of course, in that trade prior to the season. And I just don't think that he necessarily has the same development story that a typical 23, 24 year old college player a couple of years out of his draft necessarily has. So I think that that means there's a little bit more ceiling there, a little bit more development. I have to uh, ask you this one final question before I let you go, Jeff. We always know that the Dodgers don't rebuild, they just reload. Who has the deeper farm system in your opinion as you have uh, your work with Baseball America, the Dodgers or the Orioles? You know, I think for the moment, it's still the Orioles. Um, you look at that Norfolk team, and uh, I, we had a debate on this, actually, in one of our podcasts over the last week, I think it came out today. But 
I think that that team could take 40, 45, 50 games, even in a hundred games against the Oakland athletics. Like they're that loaded the top of that lineup. I think you probably take over it. Um, we'll see, you know, in terms of what they acquire this year in the draft, but we could come back here in July and half of those guys are graduated or traded to other organizations. And the conversation could be very different. I think that the international pipeline, has been better for the Dodgers. And I think certainly you can't argue against the Dodgers pitching development being better than the Orioles, though I think the Orioles are a little underrated in that, that area. It's just the middle of the top end talent. I mean, when you draft, you know, number one in the draft a bunch of different years and the Dodgers don't have that luxury, it, you know, it adds some bonus money and also allows you to do a couple of things in terms of players that Dodgers just don't have access to. Yeah, on our Dork of the Week segment on Fair Territory with Ken Rosenthal, I said my Dork of the Week was whoever decided Jackson Holiday should be in the minor leagues. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, Jeff Bonsa, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Uh, it's always great to have you on the program. Baseball America does such a tremendous job. This is the first of many, I'm sure, that you'll be joining us here on the show. We appreciate it. Absolutely. Happy to join. All right. Hot Sheet with Baseball America is Tuesday at 12 p.m. Pacific, that's 3 p.m. Eastern, of course, after foul territory. Last week's show explored more on the latest prospect, top 100, Orioles prospect Jackson Holiday. Hey, just talking about that guy. Charlie Condon being a player to watch. Hot Sheet is available on the Baseball America YouTube channel and wherever you get your podcasts. Awesome having Jeff on the program as well. And we're going to talk a little bit more Dodgers, of course, here on Dodgers territory. We have about, you know, 10, 15 minutes left in the show. I want to ask you this, though. Um, Shohei Otani, Clint, we have some more information on the infamous ball, the, the home run ball heard around the world. It seems like the Dodgers did the right thing. The fan seems to be happy. Can we put this to bed? Feels like we can put it to bed. So, of course, after we we wrap uh, last Thursday's show, the the article drops not too long after that. Oh, the Dodgers were rushing the fan through this the situation. They were strong arming her allegedly uh, to either give us the ball or we're not going to authenticate it and all that. A lot of a lot of online vitriol spilled about this. When you kind of wonder, it's like, hey, maybe these people are hearing about or, or reading all the tweets and being like, crap, we could have gotten more. Ultimately, it seems like this thing is trending towards uh, the right direction. It's trending towards a, a happy um, resolution where they the Dodgers did reach out to the fan and, and her husband. They are going to welcome them to the stadium, which is nice. On her birthday, April 12th is, is when that, that is scheduled. And I think they listened to us and listened to you about that idea of being there in the dugout club, getting themselves a, yeah on the field club level and a whole bunch of access so i'm gonna say you're a part of this you're you're a part of the solution really alana because you said get them some tickets good ones at that yeah you know i'm usually part of the problem but i'm happy to be part of the solution in this instance yeah you're right april 12th their birthday birthday meet and greet with players during bp seats in the dugout club by the way eat as much as you can because i tell you what the lexus dugout club food is legit i used to eat there every dang day i was very lucky to be able to do that um, and again, this it's baseball, right? We're not curing cancer here. Let's make this a fun experience for everybody. Shohei has the money. Shohei has um, the opportunity to make somebody's life uh, in incredibly happy. On the other side of that, I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth here, um, <laughs> you don't have the right to hold something like that hostage. I think, um, be fair, you know, let's just be fair. Uh, but I'm glad it worked out. Dodgers are, are doing the right thing as they should. They've always been a classy organization. I see no reason why uh, that should not continue. So all is well that ends well correct clint what would you yeah. ask for like you personally what would you ask for if you happen to be in the stands and you got that ball again i mean this is a different situation there you got to figure you're a few modelos deep into the game <laughs> so maybe maybe fifteen hundred dollars back i just spent on two or three beers um i think ultimately what she ends up getting is is pretty decent you know a couple of you know, it, was, it was a signed baseball signed bat a couple of signed hats and then she's going to get a full VIP experience from the team allegedly or reportedly going to be able to meet players, bring whatever she wants to have signed. And then, like you said, get the, get the nice seating there, eat everything you can possibly eat in the dugout club. Uh, that that's pretty decent because I would feel really bad possibly you know, saying that I'm, I'm um, you know, keeping such an important milestone Homer from Shohei or whoever it may be like, that means a lot more to Shohei than it means to most other people. So let him have his ball, get your moment in the sun and get a little bit of return. The, the, all of the autograph stuff is going to be worth something down the road as well.
moment in the sun no pun intended as we just had a total solar eclipse go over us while we're doing this show it is time now for last licks All right, this last lick opportunity is to talk to you, Clint Paseas, about Santa. Santa is a pit bull mix, a little bully mix that uh, is in need of a home. Great dog, great with other dogs. Um, but Santa is looking for his forever home. You can contact our organization, GidrysGuardian.org, for more information on Santa. Right now, he is being fostered through Carl's Dogs in Ventura County, California. Um, he's a wonderful pup, loving pup, and, and needs a home. So check out Santa. Uh, again, GidrysGuardian.org for more information or you can catch us on Instagram at Gidry's Guardian as well. That is, a, that is a very good looking boy. Isn't he pretty? He's such a beautiful dog. I tell you what. Oh, by the way, That's I have wild. to give credit. I know he's so sweet. I have to give credit to um, Barstool Presidente David Portnoy. I don't know a lot about him. I've never met him. I know he started Barstool Sports and now he's a gazillionaire. But he adopted a dog by Miss by the name of Miss Peaches. And that dog already has a million followers on Instagram. You and I could spend the rest of our lives trying to get a million uh, followers on combined and we wouldn't be able to get a million followers. But she is a pit bull mix and he is helping advocate for that brand, that breed because bullies are so misrepresented and so misunderstood. Um, so thank you, David Portnoy, for doing that. Um, I think it's important. Bullies are so misunderstood and I'm so happy that uh, we're getting some good publicity out there for them. All right, tell me what's coming up on your show today. Now the Dodgers are supposed to play against the Twins, Clint, but it's supposed to rain in Minnesota. So what are you planning for your show? Yeah, so so the, the channel today is a little bit in flux. Uh, I, I don't like these early games and I know people are at work. I don't know what exactly, what am I doing with my hands in these situations? <laughs> I would just tell people generally, subscribe to the All Dodgers YouTube channel. I'm gonna drop something. I'm gonna, I have, there's so many things to talk about. People wanna complain about things and I wanna give them the outlet to complain. So we will be talking Dodgers. If there is a game, I might post game something, uh, but if not, uh, everybody, make sure you tube in for Thirsty Thursday streams on Thursdays. Those are always a good time. All right. So make sure you subscribe and like to All Dodgers. That's Clint's personal podcast. We appreciate it. Hey, why don't you do the same thing for Dodgers territory? You can go to our YouTube channel on foul territory, like, subscribe, tell your friends, get involved in our chat. We want to hear from you guys. We're doing this for you, the Dodgers fans. So thanks for being with us. I'm Alana Rizzo. That's Clint Pasillas. We'll see you on Thursday, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. Bye, guys. Bye.